Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending um, our third lecture series this year from the Cancer Supportive Care Program at Stanford, presenting the nutritional consideration to support your immune system during and beyond your cancer treatment. Tonight, we have the privilege to have um, Astrid uh, Shapiro and also Helen Haley. They are both cancer uh, center dietitians that work at Stanford Palo Alto that will be presenting this lecture. Um, and please save all your questions at the end. We'll have about a 10 to 15 minute uh, q and a session so that you can feel free to ask any questions that you might have during the lecture series. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Esther, and for the program for inviting us to speak about our favorite topic, nutrition. And it looks like we've had a very strong turnout tonight, so we really appreciate everybody who took the time to come and uh, learn more about uh, the relationship between nutrition, the immune system, and cancer. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great, great. So before I begin, I kind of want to get a sense of the audience. Um, how many of us, maybe just raise your hand, are here uh, either a patient, um, a caregiver, or a loved one of somebody who's actively receiving treatment right now? Okay, great, quite a few of you, maybe about two-thirds of the group. What about people who are maybe in remission? Or, oh yeah, let's do remission a few in remission. What about, there's no cancer. I'm just interested in the topic. Great, so a really good spread. So what we're gonna do first is we're going to talk about what happens to the immune system during treatment. So why does treatment cause, uh, impact negatively the immune system? And answer the question of what, what can one do nutritionally to help it? Um, and then what we'll do is we'll sort of back up and look more large scale. Um, we'll look at what is the relationship between cancer, the nutrition, and the immune system built along the whole cancer continuum. So that could be before a diagnosis, during a diagnosis, and treatment. So we want to know, um, in the larger scheme of things, um, what is the relationship between cancer, the immune system, and nutrition? And one thing that we're really going to talk a lot about and explore is this role of inflammation, chronic inflammation. Um, and then we'll also talk about how can we modulate, how can we use the diet change the diet, modify the diet to actually modulate the inflammatory response and its impact on cancer. And we'll talk, we'll walk through this slowly to help illustrate this. And then lastly, um, we'll spend the last half of the talk um, talking about nutrition for strong immune system and healthy survivorship. So what does that sound like? Good? I've got lots of, lots of nods. Okay. So... The human immune system. So this system um, plays many different roles. Um, one of its primary roles is to help detect pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And I found this really cute little picture over here that's kind of a takeoff on the movie Jaws. So we've got this big macrophage uh, blood cell coming up to eat the bacteria and the viruses and the protozoans. And it says, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the plasma. So I thought that was good. And then over here, um, another role of the immune system is to help detect malfunctions in cells that interfere with proper functioning, such as neoplastic cells or precancerous cells. So here we have a picture of um, another macrophage that's detected a cancer cell and it's starting to engulf it and eat it, um, which is one of, uh, one of the many ways it helps to uh, control cancer in the body. So the human immune system is very complex and it's very widespread the whole body contains at least some aspect of the immune system. So there are many organs involved, also many, many specialized cells. And more importantly, with respect to inflammation, there are many associ associated signaling molecules. You may have heard of something called a cytokine. Um, cytokines and other related signaling molecules are the way that human immune cells communicate with each other about uh, a, a dangerous event in the body. And so right here, I, didn't, I don't know if you guys can see that or not. So just over here, um, we have a set of stem cells in 
the bone marrow. So the bone marrow is sort of the birthplace of most of the cells of the immune system. And these will eventually differentiate and specialize into different types of cells that travel in the blood and through the lymph systems. So here we have a schematic of the active immune system trying to regulate a precancerous lesion here. So in the middle, we have a cluster of neoplastic cells, so cells that are starting to form a tumor. And the names of the cells and the names of all the little signaling molecules aren't so important, but what's important is to have an appreciation for how complex and dynamic this system is. So when normal cells turn into cancer cells, some of them will display antigens on their surface that, that the immune system will recognize as foreign. When this happens, the immune system launches an immune response, which involves a level of inflammation. So, unfortunately, the immune system cannot always provide systemic surveillance all over the body. And what happens there is that they may not detect a precancerous lesion such as this, and then we'd get more and more proliferation. The other thing is that cancer cells have a very advanced, sneaky way of actually completely eluding the immune system. Not all cancer cells, but most of them. And that is one of the specific hallmarks of cancer cells and why oftentimes the immune system is not capable of, of controlling it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So treatment related effects on the immune system. So cancer cells, as we know, are very rapidly dividing cells. Many chemotherapy agents are designed to target one of many different reactions that has to happen in order for any cell in the body to divide. That includes divi replication of its DNA, division of the actual cell, production of new, new proteins and enzymes. So Unfortunately, many chemotherapies, well, although they work well at killing rapidly dividing cells, we aren't quite at the point where we can selectively target just the cancer cells and leave other more rapidly, more highly rapid, more rapidly dividing cells within the body. And this is where we see the development of a lot of the treatment side effects and effects on the immune cells. So toxicity to rapidly dividing cells, healthy cells can affect cells of the GI tract, our hair follicles. We know about losing hair sometimes when we're going through chemotherapy. Also our germ or our reproductive cells. Um, and also, especially the bone marrow. And remember, that's the birthplace of many of our immune cells. So often what happens is the development of this condition called myelosuppression. And so this is actually the toxicity from the treatment causes a toxic effect to the, the bone marrow, which makes it unable to continue to produce stem cells and all of the diversity of the immune cells that we normally uh, depend on for a healthy immune uh, uh, system. Some of the other cells that are born out of uh, uh, the bone marrow are our red blood cells. So we see a decrease in red blood cells, which will often lead to anemia which can cause fatigue, shortness of breath, very common. We also see a reduction in the number of platelets, which um, creates a condition called thrombocytopenia. And that means that our body is not as good as forming blood clots, so we're at higher risk for bleeding. In addition, and what I'm going to focus on with, with ex the extent, with relationship to the immune system, is this reduction in our white blood cell population, and those are the primary immune cells that are involved in immunosurveillance of the body. The ones in particular that we're interested in in in, in are the neutrophils, and these are a classification of white blood cells, and we'll learn a little bit more about that in the next slide. Well, the one after this, I promise. 
So this, um, I found some cool pictures on the internet that sort of visually illustrate this idea of myelosuppression. So we have our bone on the left. We have a close-up of the bone marrow. At the very top of, uh, to the right, we have a blood stem cell. And then we have the resulting red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And then over here to the upper right is a really great micrograph of what an actual red blood cell looks like on the left. The little guy in the middle is a platelet, and the one to the upper right is a white blood cell, is a neutrophil. And then below that, we have um, a microscopic staining um, where we see uh, more of the morph morphology of, of these, these types of cells. So we're going to talk about neutropenia next. We were talking about how important neutrophils are. So neutrophils are a population of white blood cell that account for about 60% of circulating white blood cells. And what's really key about these guys is they are the first responders when we have something um, that's an infection, like a bacteria, a virus, fungus, or, or some other uh, possible uh, toxin from the environment that's causing a localized um, infection. Um, these are produced in the bone marrow, as we know. It takes about 10 to 14 days to the, for them to mature in the bone marrow. However, what's interesting about them is once they are released into the circulation, they only live for four to eight hours. So you can appreciate the fact that we, in order to sustain um, a very robust immune system, we need to have consistent production of these sort of around the clock almost. When chemotherapy is added to the matrix, it causes this bone marrow suppression, which leads to cell damage. And now we've got an impaired uh, immune response. And so a lot of times, back to the initial question is, what can I do during treatment to help boost my immune system? We get these questions of, you know, my doctor said that the, this is going to cause my, my immune system to break down while I'm getting treatment. What can I do? I did see a question in the back, and we are hoping that you can save it till the end. It's OK. Thank you. Appreciate that. So another aspect of this myelosuppression that happens is that it happens in waves. So when we first get our chemotherapy dose, we usually will get our chemotherapy in rounds, like once a week, once every two weeks, once every three weeks. That's the typical uh, timing. Uh, uh, time frames. So at the very beginning of time over on the left, you'll see that we get our chemotherapy, our blood counts start dropping again as an effect of that toxicity. But they'll reach a point at the very bottom, and we call that the nadir. It's at the point at which our blood cells are the lowest as a result of a chemotherapy dose. As the chemotherapy is processed by the system, it's flushed out, the toxic side effects start to kind of go away, the bone marrow is actually able to start regenerating those blood cells. And so we'll see the curve go up. And then as soon as we get another round of chemotherapy, it will go down again. So nadir, it's the lowest uh, of the white blood cell count, follow, the lowest point of white blood cell count following treatment. And this also affects the red blood cells and platelets. So one thing that's interesting is that each chemotherapy agent sort of has its own predictable nadir. Um, there are classes of chemotherapies that will produce a rapid or a moderate or a prolonged nadir. And so those nadir points, as you can see with the rapid nadir period, could happen after 7 to 10 days. And then over to the right, we see that the recovery period usually will take about a week to three weeks, and it goes on. So nadirs can happen anywhere between seven to 10 days, three, what is that, three weeks to five weeks, and can take as long as two months to recover, really dependent on the chemotherapy. Also, how often you're getting dosing and this and that. So I think that's really important to understand in terms of why does this happen to the immune system during treatment? So what can you do from a nutrition standpoint to help regenerate these cells, support your immune system? The key is really 
adequate nutrition. In particular, very important to get adequate amounts of protein. And in terms of protein sources, anything that I talk about here that relates to nutrition, Helen is actually going to lead the second um, part of the talk, and she will actually go into a lot of depth. So I'm going to be a little vague because there's other things I want to talk about now. But with respect to protein, we want to make sure that we get adequate protein, that it's complete protein, um, or it's from a mixed protein source. And there's evidence that in a sufficient amount of protein actually prolongs the nadir period and also helps, doesn't help, but also um, reduces the amount of effective um, uh, immune cells, blood cells, platelets um, in, the, in the system. We also want to make sure that we get adequate amount of calories. And one of the ways that we know that is that we're not losing weight. When we start treatment, we actually want to maintain the same weight, at least until we get through the first couple rounds and then we know that we're not uh, suffering nutritionally or from, from some of the side effects, such as nausea or vomiting or diarrhea or constipation. The other thing within the calories is the best way to get calories is focusing on carbohydrates. Some people will be surprised to hear that you would want a mixture of complex and some limited simple sugars. And people are like, well, sugar feeds cancer. I don't want to have any sugar. Actually, during treatment, the body burns energy so quickly that we actually do benefit from an energetic standpoint and also from, from a thinking and a brain energy standpoint to give ourselves a little bit of simple sugar here and there to kind of, because we're not as able to mobilize the energy from our carbohydrate stores. We may not even have any. So also fats are really important. You want to focus on plant-based or omega-3 types of fats, which are anti-inflammatory, which is kind of key to what we're going to talk about later. Um, so omega-3s, you can get them from uh, plant sources like walnuts, flax, but also from cold water fish like salmon and sardines. Vitamin minerals are also very important. They are sort of the cofactors, the helpers that help all the enzymes and the metabolic uh, pathways in our body do the work they need to do to sustain our nutrition and our energy. The some of the best sources are whole grains, vegetables, fruit, nuts, and seeds. We really don't want you going for supplements. We want you to first try to get them from whole foods unless you have a nutrient deficiency, such as low magnesium or low potassium, which can be common side effects of certain treatment agents. Also, fluids, of course, are very important. Adequate water, stay hydrated. When we're really hydrated, we get really tired, we get cranky. Um, so water and also other fluids that contain um, a variety of, um, of vit uh, vitamins, minerals, and also are lower in the sugar scheme. So some of the ones that I um, suggest to my patients oft often will be like a broth, um, vegetable juices, or diluted 100% fruit juices. So the other consideration actually to help support your immune system uh, during the myel myelosuppression is first to remember that because your immune system is reduced, you're at much higher risk for foodborne illness. So what you can do, like I said, to help support your immune system and reduce the introduction of pathogens into your system is you can practice good food safety precautions. Sometimes people don't think about this when they think about supporting the immune system, but basically you're taking away opportunities for the immune system that's compromised to have a breakdown. So we definitely wanna wash our hands before handling food or eating. We wanna wash all produce under running water and we wanna use friction. We don't wanna use, um, you know, some people will say, oh, should I use alcohol? Should I use soap? No, not necessary, just do a good job running water friction. Um, you want to avoid cross-contamination, so you don't want to take a knife and cut up some raw meat and then go over and cut up your vegetables and then stick your vegetables in the refrigerator. That's You're just asking for bacterial growth there. Um, you want to store perishables um, at safe temperatures. 
you really um, may want to think about avoiding salad bars, buffets, picnics, food that's been sitting out at room temperature for extended periods of time. Um, you also want to avoid eating raw, undercooked, or unpasteurized foods. Um, sometimes people think that, oh, you know, getting raw, unpasteurized honey, that's going to be healthier for me. Well, you want to be careful because there could be a high bacteria load in there. So. Hey, so that now, now that we've considered some of the aspects of the immune system during treatment, let's explore the relationship between cancer, the immune system, and nutrition throughout the cancer continuum. So the cancer continuum, what does that mean? So that would mean maybe you've never had cancer. Maybe you know somebody who has cancer and you're interested. Maybe you just got diagnosed. Maybe you're going through treatment. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're in survivorship. So we're looking at the whole grand scheme here. One thing that's interesting to know is that whatever stage of the continuum that you're at, we now have very, very solid evidence that inflammation, and here's my cool little effect here, <laughs> um, which is a natural biological immune response, is involved at all aspects of the cancer continuum. So most of us, when we think of inflammation, we think of acute inflammation. We get, there's a stimulus. We get pricked by uh, a needle, or we step on something and get a wound in our foot, or maybe we accidentally bite the inside of our cheek or something like that. Immune helper cells will, will come about, and they will do their healing job. The stimulus will go away. Great, we're healed no more inflammation, quick, to the point, gone. So what we're more interested in with respect to cancer is this idea of chronic low-level inflammation. So this is a situation in which we'll have an ongoing stimulus, a stimulus that never goes away, and thus perpetuates more and more and more inflammation. So our helper cells, like it says, will come along, they'll try to do their job, but the ongoing stimulus will recruit even more cells of the immune system, increase inflammation, and this actually leads to changes in cell function. So in this repetitive cycle, it leads to increased disease. So one thing that's interesting is that when I talked about the fact that you have this proliferation of different cells that come together and you have these, these molecules that they release to communicate, a lot of those, when present in a microinflammatory environment for a long time, those can actually start causing oxidative damage to neighboring cells. These are not communication uh, molecules that are meant to sustain for long periods of time. The downside of them being in an area for a prolonged amount of time and even in higher levels, like I said, is results is actual damage to, to healthy cells, which can damage their DNA and make cancer more likely. So we know that chronic low-level inflammation over time, like I said, can lead to DNA damage and can make cancer more likely. So some of these examples of how this might work are certain health conditions that, that involve chronic inflammation. For example, gastric uh, reflux, so GERD. We've got a lot of... Um, acid that's constantly moving up into the esophagus, burning the esophagus, causing inflammation, and over time can cause a lot of scarring and harm to those cells. Now, that condition is very, um, is, is a very strong risk factor for developing esophageal cancer. Also, other health conditions like pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas, very well known to lead to pancreatic cancer. Same thing with um, the inflammation in the liver, hepatitis. Also, certain um, viruses like um, HPV and um, um, hepatitis virus B, those types of viruses can lead to a lot of chronic inflammation in the body, 
thus leading to cancers. The other thing that we see um, with respect to chronic inflammation is a, a relationship between obesity and overweight in chronic inflammation. We'll see this in a couple slides, but we actually know, we've learned by looking at the microenvironment of fat tissue, or what we call adipose tissue, that there's a very large infiltration of immune cells and their signaling molecules. Also, of course, poor diets, pro-inflammatory diets can contribute to this chronic low-level inflammation. So we know that there are many environmental factors linked to cancer, toxins, poor appetite, inactivity, overweight, um, environmental, and I, and I include lifestyle factors as somewhat of as an environmental factor because it's a modifiable uh, component to risk factor. Um, for developing cancer. And then we see that a lot of these risk factors are associated with some form of chronic inflammation. So we have some statistics here. 20% of cancers are linked to chronic infections, and we talked about some of them earlier. 30% of cancers are linked to tobacco smoking and inhaled toxins. So smoking definitely creates an inflammatory process in the lung tissue. 35% of cancers are linked to dietary factors, of which 20% are linked to obesity. So we see this pattern of chronic low-level inflammation contributing to risk of cancer. So from a, horse, for a, from a historical standpoint, We've known, we've had these ideas about the relationship between inflammation and cancer for a long time. It was actually back in the 1800s that Dr. Rudolf Virchow, who's actually thought of as the father of pathology, he first noticed a possible link when he observed leukocytes, a type of immune cell concentrated within tumors. Today, after years, decades, maybe centuries, I guess, of research, we have now know, and we have many different examples, that inflammation plays roles in all stages of cancer. So initiation, the, the generation of a cancerous cell, promotion, malignant conversion, invasion, and metastasis. So, one thing that I have here, which I think is very interesting, is a schematic, sort of a, a journey, if you will, of a healthy cell at the very top that exists in a pro-inflammatory environment in the body. And you can see that it's, it's getting all of these environmental insults to it. And we believe that for a cell to become a cancer cell, it must more than likely than not um, experience several different types of insults before it becomes to the point where it becomes a cancer cell. So we see mutagens, cytokines, lots of cytokines, uh, which again are those communication molecules in the inflammatory response that are released from immune cells. We also see um, react ROS stands for reaction, re reactive oxygen species. So those are what we would call free radicals. And we might have a lot more of those because maybe we're not eating our fruits and vegetables. Um, and the reason to eat those fruits and vegetables is to bathe our body in antioxidants, which help quench these to reduce the destruction to cells. Moving along, we see a little X in the nucleus of the cell. So this cell is a cell where there's been some DNA damage. And now it's starting to divide rapidly. We see the pre-malignant cells. Around the size, we see all of a sudden the immune system is saying, hey, wait a minute, there's, there's something foreign there. When we get down to the early terminodule, one of the things that's very noticeable about this is we see this infiltration of immune cells within the cancer, the tumor microenvironment. We also, the little red marks um, are actually the beginning of capillaries growing to that bed that are bringing more and more nutrients to the growing cells. And then once we have advanced tumor, we have basically the same thing, but on a larger scale, we see more and more immune cells, more cytokines. Again, this constant low grade inflammation. And of course, we can get to a metastatic state. Something that was really 
kind of shocking to me when I was learning about this is to think that the immune system, which is supposed to be protecting us and keeping us healthy, in this sense suggests that it's actually working against us from a health perspective and actually feeding an unhealthy state. Would you guys agree with that? That's kind of surprising. I was kind of surprised when I heard that. So we mentioned a little bit about obesity and how we see lots of immune cells in the microenvironment of, of fat tissue. So if we look to the left side of the screen, we see a comparison of fat tissue or adipose tissue from a lean person versus what we might see in an obese person. And the thing that's so striking about this is that, wow, towards the bottom, we see larger cells. Theoretically, there's supposed to be the same amount of cells, but we just see that the adipose population on the bottom has a larger volume. So we see many more immune cells, and we see lots of cofactors, lots of signaling cells, and we see this proliferation of an inflammatory environment. So the American Institute for, for Cancer, what is it? Cancer Research, there's many different ones. Um, this one uh, is a poster that they've uh, devised talking about the risks of overweight and cancer. So inflammation, chronic inflammation, is actually only one um, cause of cancer with respect to obesity. There are many other causes that we know of related have to do with hormones, with insulin, and whatnot. So this is a really... We've really backed up and we're looking at inflammation from many aspects of tumor development. Over on the right, we've talked about the role of chronic inflammation, of infection. There can be an autoimmune uh, a component. If we go over to the green part, inflammation caused by environmental and dietary exposures. Interestingly, down here at the bottom, there's actually also tumor associated uh, tumor-associated inflammation, and that kind of makes sense based on what we just learned, that the proliferation of the cancer cells and the, being able to evade the, the effect of the immune system promotes a more inflammatory environment. And then on top of all of that, at the very top, top we can also have a therapy-induced inflammation, maybe from radiation or maybe from when we have a large amount of cells dying off at the same time. They're releasing a lot of uh, and, and destroying a lot of the um, immune cells in the environment, which can also lead to release of a lot of extra cytokines, which make the inflammatory response even louder. So we know nutrition is one of several modifiable factors that can influence how pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory the, the immune response is. Thus, knowing that, we can actually modify, theoretically, our diet to influence how pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory our system is, thus having an influence on our level of cancer risk. But how do we actually measure the effect of nutrition or dietary pattern on the level of inflammation in the body? Does anybody have any ideas? No? So a, gr a research group down at the University of Southern Carolina designed this index called the Dietary Inflammatory Index. So this is a tool that they're using, and what it does is it estimates the overall inflammatory potential of a particular dietary pattern. Now this was based on extensive data, over 6,000 reports and studies derived from a combination of cell cultures, of animal and epidemiological studies. Um, what it is, is it's a score of specific foods and food constituents that are known to increase or reduce levels of inflammation in the body. And it's based on 45 specific components of which I'll show you in the next slide. 
So what it does is it actually measures inflammation by measuring biomarkers, which are those cytokines, which are these chemicals that are released from and produced from uh, immune cells as a response to inflammation. It also does measure other aspects uh, within the body, such as different hormone levels and growth factors that are associated with a more or less inflammatory state. What I presented here is just a very, very annotated list, just to give you an idea. So these are the 45 components. Um, always looks at total calories, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Um, it looks at the, f um, the, the fat profile, uh, cl also cholesterol. In the middle, it looks at uh, several vitamins and minerals um, that are involved in uh, generation of cells in the immune system. And then towards the bottom of the, the middle row and all along the, the right, column rather, um, are uh, constituents of foods that we know have anti-inflammatory um, effects and antioxidant effects in the body. So they've done, they've, they've used this tool and applied it to many different populations and studies, but what I'd like to do is sort of walk you through one of the studies they did to illustrate how this can be used to measure the effect, the inflammatory effect of diets in, in one's body. So what they did is they compared three different dietary patterns, fast food, Mediterranean, and macrobiotic. Uh, the data from the diet um, comprised a 24-hour recall, so what one would eat in 24 hours. And they adjusted for total calorie intake because there's going to be a difference in the amount of factors that are produced from a 1,000-calorie diet versus a 2,000-calorie diet, even if it's the same diet. The DII scoring, and this is where I realized that I put a boo-boo in your slides, um, we printed these out earlier today, and as I was going through this a little before the presentation, I realized that I had switched some information. Where it says up on the screen, more positive DII numbers indicate a pro-inflammatory state, that should actually be more, uh, on your slide rather, um, on your printout, it actually says more negative numbers. And below, I switched it as well. Up here, correctly, it states negative numbers are more anti-inflammatory, but on the handout, it will say positive. So just, if you could please make a note of that. So this is the diet recall of our fast food diet. Bacon and egg, cheese biscuits, small coffee, double cheeseburger, fries, and some sodas, crispy chicken sandwich for lunch. Our Mediterranean diet, we see sort of a more variety of different foods. Um, most of it plant-based, although we are having a little of a tilapia fish for dinner. It's pretty tasty. And then our macrobiotic diet, um, which is very involved but looks very delicious, is actually um, a purely plant-based diet, which I thought was notable here. So when we compared the the DII scores, we find that the fast food diet had the most positive score, meaning the most pro-inflammatory, whereas the Mediterranean, the probiotic, had the least inflammatory potential based on the scoring. I don't know if we're surprised or not. So let's look at some of the numbers here. Um, we see that the energy is all about 2,000 calories, similar amounts of protein, one thing that I notice in the carbohydrates is that the carbohydrates and the fiber and the macrobiotic are significantly higher than the others. And that doesn't surprise me again, because like I stated, it's a completely plant-based diet. When we're looking at fats, does anybody notice any, anything interesting when we're looking at different types of fats? Whoop, let me go back. Maybe differences in trans fats or... Saturated fats, we see more saturated fats in the fast food versus the Mediterranean and the macrobiotic, and we do know that saturated fats can produce a more pro-inflammatory, although we do need some saturated fats in our diet, so it's not all bad. We don't believe in foods are bad or good. We believe in moderation. Um, anything else interesting? 
Trans fats, yes. So we see four grams of trans fats in the fast food and really trace amounts in the Mediterranean and the macrobiotic diet. So let's move on to vitamins and minerals. Any glaring differences here? Yeah, beta carotene and vitamin A, significantly higher in the Mediterranean and the macrobiotic diet. And these have many functions in the body, but they are very, very strong antioxidants. So regulating, toning down the reactive oxygen species is one of the roles of these antioxidants. Okay, moving along. Now we're looking at food parameters such as the flavonoids. So flavonoids, there's many different groups, subgroups of them, and these are what we belong to what we call the phytochemicals in the body. And these have a lot of antioxidants and a lot of anti-inflammatory effects in the body. So anybody notice any trends here in terms of the flavonoids? Yeah, so significantly higher in both the Mediterranean and the macrobiotic diet. Whoops, let's go back. Right, so somebody was commenting that that's promising because you don't have to eat all this stuff that doesn't look appetizing. You can eat the Mediterranean diet and still get a big benefit. We'd have to write to them and ask. She was wondering if we threw some chicken in there, how would that modulate the numbers? So there's a lot of ongoing research with this index. Um, they're looking at different populations. They're looking at genetic variation. Um, we're learning a lot about uh, nutrigenomics, which is the study of how nutrients affect gene expression in the body. Um, we're looking at differences between different cultural groups, geographical areas, and also looking at different life stages. As we know, oftentimes people in their 20s have a different dietary pattern than somebody maybe in their 60s. So. so now, let's just kind of review a little bit. So we talked about what happens with the immune system during cancer treatment and what we can do nutritionally to help. We next kind of looked more large scale. We looked at uh, this relationship between the immune system, cancer, and nutrition throughout the cancer continuum. Talked a lot about uh, inflammation and its contribution to cancer and cancer risk. Um, we talked about um, the dietary inflammatory index and how we can use that to help us evaluate how pro or anti-inflammatory a diet is. Um, and now we're going to switch gears. I'm going to have Helen come up. She's going to talk about nutrition for strong immune system and healthy survivorship. So thanks, everyone. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Helen Halley. I job share with Astrid, so it's only fitting that we kind of job share this presentation. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit more of the practical, the foods, how, what foods, how much, and so forth. I do want to start with this slide first, just so that there's an overview of what are the keys to a strong immune system, because it's, it's more things than just diet. Um, healthy body weight, which Astrid has touched upon already. Um, this is neither under nor over nutrition. If you're undernourished or malnourished, your body doesn't have enough uh, nutrient stores to recover, to to um, to recover from treatment, to help fight your immune system. If you're overnourished, we tend to think of someone being overweight or obese. And again, we already mentioned that that's a state of being uh, a state of being an inflammation. So we know that's already associated with quite a few cancers. So having a healthy body weight really is key. Adequate hydration, we can't ignore that. Water helps us flush toxins out of the body. It helps us carry nutrients and oxygens to all the cells that we have. It helps in the production of lymph, which is your lymphatic system, the system where all your white blood cells go around and carry throughout your body. Um, it's what protects our mouth and our eyes, which are sources of infections, so keeping them moist. And it helps us with digesting food and absorbing the nutrients from your good diet. Another key to a strong immune system is getting sufficient quality sleep. We know, um, you know, sleep's a time of rest and recovery, and that someone who has chronic sleep deprivation, they do have more inflammatory markers in their body. Um, so getting enough sleep is important and consistently. 
We know that sleep also enhances the formation of a it's called immune memory, so like adaptive um, immune response. For example, if I had two different people who got a vaccine and one person slept for nine hours and the next only slept for four hours that night, the next day we measure their serum levels, the one who slept more has more of that, those antibodies from that vaccine. So they're gonna be more likely to be able to fight the infection that they were vaccinated for. So sleep really is important um, to allow your body um, to be at its best shape. Avoiding toxins, this is a really big one. Some are avoidable and some aren't. Really big avoidable one is tobacco. Um, tobacco smoke, even secondhand smoke. Um, alcohol here in the context of cancer is considered a really big toxin. We know alcohol is related to quite a few cancers as well. Um, pollution, as you can avoid it, air, water. Lead, like you find in paint or arsenic and water. There's quite a big list of um, toxins. I'm not gonna go too much into them. I will mention about um, the, the things we put in our foods, so how we farm, you, we may add pesticides and fertilizers um, and other chemicals. And so if it does not reduce your consumption of fruits and vegetables, then it may be wise to choose organic um, to reduce your exposure to the pesticides, the fertilizers, and chemicals. So that's one change you could consider. And my last key, which is going to be the rest of my slides, are all about good balanced eating and going into that. So here I outlined some nutrition keys to a strong immune system. A few I'll go into detail a little bit more than others, but I'll be sure to hit on all of these. Um, so we have protein, fiber, omega-3 fatty acid in particular. Um, a list of vitamins, a list of minerals, and I will talk a lot about phytonutrients as well. And I, we plug a lot, foods, not supplements. All right, so what do we know? We, we have a lot of research, we have a lot more to do still, but from what we know, from completed studies, we know that a low fruit and vegetable intake is inversely associated with overall cancer risk. Um, we also know that people who eat more vegetables, they um, compare the people who eat very little and people who eat more, have lower risk of lung cancer, head and neck cancers, stomach cancer, colorectal cancers. We know that people who eat more fiber also have less colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Those are probably the most studied cancers, those three. Um, and in the studies that showed this relationship, the amount of fiber is 18 to 24 grams a day if you're someone who wanted to, to examine your diet closely. And our, our recommended um, amounts of fiber that anyone should be having is 25 to 38. So it's really just meeting your daily recommendations. It's just that the typical diet is actually really low in fiber. It's closer to 14. We know that red and processed meats increase quite a number of cancers, but these are the ones with the most convincing data, so colorectal, stomach, and lung cancer risk. We also know that um, people who eat a lot of salt-preserved or pickled foods have more stomach cancers and head and neck cancers, and it's, it is thought that it's the sodium related to that. We know that people who eat soy foods, not supplements, but soy foods um, have actually lower risk of these hormonal cancers, the breast, the breast, prostate, endometrial, ovarian cancer also in this category. Um, and so there's components of these foods that we know are great, like vegetables have that vitamin A, which is a strong antioxidant. So researchers thought, let's try to give people vitamin A supplements. They're likely to have less cancer. They actually found the very opposite. Um, they were testing it in patients with lung cancer um, or risk for lung cancer, so they were smokers. Um, and they that group that got the vitamin A supplement ended up with more cancers to the point that they had to stop the study because it was that dangerous. So 
Um, there are other studies very similarly trying to test, do the supplements help? And we have good, strong studies to show in men um, who took vitamin E supplements had higher rates of prostate cancer. Um, men who ate more calcium or took calcium supplements had more prostate cancer. Um, another study with folic acid supplementation, there was more uh, breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer as well. So, so far, we have not had a s good studies to say that supplements reduces cancer. So I just want to share that. Um, the cases where earlier where we had lower risk of cancer, those were from food sources. So the soy, for example, we saw this reduction from soy foods. It d we did not see that from when they used soy supplements. Um, and then the last one, we know overall high vitamin C intake is just, um, you have lower overall cancer risk. And again, that's vitamin C rich foods. It was not seen in vitamin C supplements. Okay, so again, foods, not supplements, if you take anything away from here. So from everything we know, um, we, we as an American <laughs> Institute for Cancer Research, has put together these guidelines for cancer survivors. There are eight that I'll go through over the next two slides. From all the good studies we know, these are the best recommendations. We would tell you what can you do to reduce your risk of a recurrence or a secondary cancer. Be as lean as possible without being underweight. Be physically active. Uh, the amount and level is a little bit different depending on who you ask, but all of them will tell you to be physically active. The AICR says at least 30 minutes every day, specifically moderate to vigorous activity as you can tolerate it. Avoid sugary drinks and limit consumption of energy dense foods. This is all indirectly related to cancer by the means of obesity. So added sugars, um, energy dense, meaning high calorie foods, more likely to be obese, more likely to have cancer. Eating a variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, such as beans, so a mostly plant-based diet. Um, and then limiting consumption of red meats and then avoiding even processed meats. We have studies to show that even small intakes of processed meats is highly linked to colorectal cancer. So right now there isn't a safe level for processed meats and that's defined with your bacon, sausage, ham, any deli meats, hot dogs, salami, pastrami. Um, and I did define here red meats includes beef, pork, and lamb, and then game meats if you eat those. What, what are the meats to choose if you eat any would be fish and poultry. Um, if you consume it at all, limit your alcohol to just two drinks a day for men and one for women a day. What was that? No, no, I say a week. Oh, <laughs> if you don't drink, don't start. Limit your consumption of salty foods, added salt or foods processed with salt. That's actually where most of our sodium intake is from. It's not from the salt shaker. It's usually from processed foods. It's already in there. And then the AICR promotes what we keep saying, don't rely on supplements to protect against cancer. We just do not have studies to show that, and we actually have studies to show the opposite. Okay. So a little bit more practical, putting all those recommendations together, well, how much should I eat? How much, how much is, do I need? If you're going by meal, just visualizing your plate, um, two thirds of that should be mostly plant-based, your fruits, your vegetables, minimally processed grains, some beans. The other third should be some source of lean protein, whether you eat fish or chicken or um, eggs, lentils, yogurt. If you go by day, um, I put quantities here and I put little tilde marks for estimates because you may need more or less depending on your body size, but it's a lot easier to know two cups of fruit than if I said three to four servings. So I put amounts here. Um, so two cups of fruit, three cups of cooked vegetables, one cup of some type of legume, whether that's some beans or soy product or lentils, six ounces of whole grain, and six ounces of lean protein. 
a little bit more specific about grains. Each slice of whole wheat bread is an ounce. Every cup of whole wheat pasta is about two ounces. Um, and for lean protein, um, about like a, a deck of cards is about three ounce um, if you're looking at fish or, or chicken. So it's just to give you some gauge there. I did have a couple of things that go by week. You don't have to eat it every day, which would be fatty fish so that you get enough of those omega-3 fatty acids. So two servings or roughly eight ounces of um, a, a fatty fish. And then for red meats, earlier I said to limit it. Well, how, limit it to what? Limit it to 18 ounces or less a week. Okay, so that's three times a week of a good size burger, if if you if you wanted that. Um, but I w I would say even with red meat, less is better. The question was, is farm fish or how do you get your fatty fish? How do you get those omega three fatty acids? I'm gonna go over that a little bit later. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, so servings? Yes. So every slice of of whole wheat bread would be one ounce. Every, say, uh, one cup of pasta is two ounce. Every cup of rice is two ounce. Every cup of oatmeal is about two ounce. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't take much to get those whole grains. Like the measuring cups, so the question was what size of cups, like the measuring cups. Like, what you, like you would use when you're cooking or baking. Yeah, measuring cups. Coffee mugs. Coffee mugs are, are usually more like 12 ounces, usually more, more than even a cup. <laughs> so it doesn't take a lot. OK. Um, let's see. We're going to move on to the next slide. I put together just kind of randomly uh, what a day looks like to get all those servings of foods that you need. And then I plug that into Super Tracker, which is put forth by the USDA, um, who if you remember, USDA used to have the food pyramid, and then now they have the my plate. But they still kind of think about foods and food groups. And so I just want to show you here to get the, these different food groups, such as your whole grains, your vegetables, enough fruits, enough dairy, and enough protein. Um, this is what this sample day looks like. Um, I hit the targets on just about most of them, except for the dairy group. Um, several things about that. We don't eat perfectly every day. And maybe to this day, um, I didn't eat enough dairy, but maybe the next day I had an extra serving of ice cream or something. So it can be made up. Or the dairy group gives you protein and it gives you calcium. So I'm going to be sure maybe I had some extra beans for my protein or an extra egg. And for calcium, I'm going to be sure I chose some really good dark leafy greens as a plant-based source for calcium. So there are other ways to make up if, if you didn't tolerate or didn't want to eat some food. There's usually something else to help you make that up. Um, and if, you, if you're interested to just try this to see what your day looks like of eating, um, you can just search Super Tracker. It's specifically supertracker.usda.gov. So it's really easy to use, just, just to see where you're at. And you can plug in your specific size, so it'll give you more specific targets as well. OK. I'm going to touch base on protein, because Astrid points out, and maybe you've even heard it from your healthcare providers, eat more protein. <laughs> Get more protein. Why is that? Why do we keep saying more protein? Well, the protein is the building blocks of our body. It's our structural proteins. It's our muscle fibers. It's the blood proteins. It's the, your immune cells. Are, they're all made of protein. It's um, functional. It's the enzymes for digestion, for metabolic functions. So we really, really need that enough protein. And if we don't eat enough, our bodies will break down our own muscle stores to, 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 to get it. Um, and I remind you that it's not just your muscles and your arms and legs for me to move. You're, you use muscles to breathe, and your heart's a muscle. So when you get so depleted or undernourished you're not eating enough, that's where it's really hard to recover from that, and you may not be tolerating treatment well at all. So protein can help slow down that weight loss and that muscle breakdown, even if you weren't getting enough calories. So it's really important to get enough protein, whether you're eating well or struggling to eat. I would prioritize protein. 
our goal when we talk about maintaining weight, we're really aiming to maintain your lean muscle mass. That's one way we can tell you're holding on to that is when you're maintaining your weight. Here is a list of quite a few protein sources. In the black are the big categories, and then the blue is a bit more specific within those categories. Um, you can see if, if you did eat meats, fish and poultry top the list here. If you were a vegetarian, you can still choose egg, dairy, beans, nuts, seeds, whole grains, soy products, vegetables. And even if you were a vegan, there's still quite a few left on that list there for you to get enough protein. So um, all of it adds up. Some, I think, are forgotten. Like even your whole grains and your vegetables can be a significant source of your protein. Just make sure each of your meal and each of your snacks, if you eat those, um, contains something, some good choices up here. I'm going to talk about phytonutrients. Um, what are phytonutrients? Phytonutrients, um, you might also hear them be called phytochemicals. They're the bioactive, meaning they actually do something in your body when you eat them, unlike, say, fiber, which all it does is just push things through. It's non-essential, meaning you can live without them, but they're very beneficial. Um, and they're, they only come from plant sources. So that's phytonutrients. They're your natural protection against age-related diseases. Um, those are your cardiovascular disease, cancer, neuromuscular degeneration. Um, and they also protect against environmental toxicity. If you think about plants that grow outside amongst the elements, they need to have defense mechanisms. So we're benefiting from that natural protection. Um, they're found from fruits and vegetables and whole grain. And these are the classifications of phytonutrients, the carotenoids, the phenolics, the alkaloids, nitrogen-containing compounds, and organosulfur compounds. And I'm going to go over more common ones known um, on the next slide. The phytonutrients target um, the cancer initiation and the promotion phases of cancer progression, so the very early beginnings of cancer development. That's where um, you gain the benefit from there. You prevent it from happening at all. Phytonutrients are mainly known for their antioxidant properties um, or, or anti-inflammation. You may have heard this too, is eat the rainbow. I hope by the end of this slide, I'm gonna convince you why. Um, it's always best to get your antioxidants and essential nutrients from food, not supplements. So getting eating a rainbow, meaning you're getting all a variety of colorful foods because they each provide a big source of some phytonutrient or antioxidant that you can benefit from. Um, so if you're looking at the reds, one significant um, phytonutrient is lycopene, which um, we know is tied to lower risk of prostate cancer. And so you'll find that really big in tomatoes, in um, watermelon, for example. Your orange uh, colored produce like carrots, sweet potatoes, you're gonna find beta carotene or vitamin A. Um, and that's we know is a very powerful antioxidant. Your yellow, orange, um, like this c category is for your citrusy things. You think of vitamin C, which, um, and also flavonoids. So you got, a, you got an antioxidant and you got another phytonutrient. Um, this will be helpful for detoxifying harmful substances in the body. Dark leafy greens, I cannot promote enough. Up here, it's categorized with, um, associated with folate, but really your dark leafy greens is also a really big source of vitamin A and calcium and iron and f B vitamins it's, and fiber. So get your dark leafy greens, your spinach, your kale, your collard greens, your mustard greens, turnip greens, your bok choy. There's many choices to choose from. Your green-white categories, here is your cruciferous vegetables, so your broccoli, mustard greens, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. Um, here are yet another phytonutrients, your indoles, your lutein's. Um, the, if we're moving on towards white slash green, you got garlic, onions, chives. This is your allium, um, and not only as a 
phytonutrient, but also we know that allium has, is associated really good, um, with good heart health, is what I'm trying to say. Your blues, your blueberries, your purple grapes, your plums, um, anthocyanins is a type of phyto phytonutrient that is an antioxidant, essentially. So um, it destroys free radicals. It scavenges those free radicals in your body and gets rid of it. Red purple, your grapes, your berries, your plums. This would be like when you think about red wine too. It's a type of flavonoid. Um, and so we have a phytonutrient here that may decrease estrogen production. Your brown um, here is categorized as your fiber. We said earlier, high fiber intake, lower risk of cancer overall, specifically colorectal, um, but whole grains and beans, nuts, lentils. So I went into detail about some of them, and I want to be sure I touch base um, and give you sources of foods for these remaining nutrition keys um, for, to support your immune, immune system. And so I'm going to list them over the next two slides. And I won't read them all here, um, but here I mentioned earlier your omega-3 fatty acid uh, food choices. Here's quite a few here. I listed some fish. Um, but you can also get it from olive oil, walnuts, avocado, cashews, your seeds, your hemp seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and all your nuts and seed butter. So almond butter, um, sunflower butter. Okay. Um, um, vitamin E, vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid. You're going to see some reduc um, not reduction repeated foods up here, because foods just don't necessarily give you one thing. They can give you several good nutrients. So I just want to say, if you don't like one type of nut, try a different one. If you don't like one type of green, try a different one. There's lots of choices there. <clears throat> Moving on to zinc, selenium, iron, and copper. Um, another thing I want to say about this group of minerals is that they do have a tendency to compete to get absorbed into your body, which is another reason you don't want to just eat one food all the time because it's high in this one thing. You want a variety so that they all have equal chance and you're more likely to get enough of all of them rather than a lot of one, but then not enough of something else. I do list a lot of meat sources up here, but you're going to see quite a few available plant uh, sources too. So a well-planned diet, even a vegetarian or vegan, can get enough from just foods. Okay. Um, another thing I want to say is I might have listed up here something like, say, white beans for iron, but really any beans. Kidney beans, black beans, pinto beans are high also in iron. So I'm just listing some of these top examples. <clears throat> okay. It's hard to think about just single foods or single food nutrients or phytonutrients. And so I want to talk about more widely a, a lifestyle, a diet style that you could just keep in mind and follow. One of the examples mentioned earlier was that Mediterranean diet. We know that with the Mediterranean diet, it's very anti inflammatory based on that, um, even with or without that study that Astrid mentioned earlier. So here's a description of the Mediterranean diet. It's mostly plant-based. It's very high in vegetables and legumes, your beans and your nuts, and soy. It's very high in olive oil. That does make it distinct from your typical cancer recommendations. Um, it does promote very fresh, natural, seasonal choices, um, using fresh fruit as desserts as opposed to sweets for desserts. It does include your breads and other grains. It does include things from your dairy product. It does include eggs. It is low in red meat and animal fats in total. It doesn't necessarily exclude them completely. It uses herbs and spices to flavor your foods as opposed to sodium. It does emphasize some two concepts that usually aren't talked about, um, one of which is enjoying your meals um, with friends and family, and then getting plenty of exercise. We know that plenty of good studies to show Mediterranean diet, um, P3 
people who follow the Mediterranean diet also have, um, it can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. It can reduce your cholesterol levels. So there's a lot of heart health benefits. And I say that because cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer above cancer. And if you live long enough, it's gonna be one of those two, um, very likely. So you wanna keep your heart healthy. Luckily, you can have one diet that can lower cancer risk and be heart healthy. This is a visual of the Mediterranean diet. Um, it does go back to the pyramid, which is nice to visualize. Basis is that socializing and enjoying foods with others, being physically active. If we go into nutrition, this big bottom piece, this two thirds of your plate, should be all your plants, your fruits, your vegetables, your beans, your nuts, your lentils, your pasta. It does include some seafood, partic particularly fish, bless you. It does include poultry and eggs and cheese and yogurt, and then occasionally some red meats, some sweets, some desserts. Another difference with the Mediterranean diet is it does emphasize red wine. Um, and again, if you don't drink, don't start. If you were to choose any alcohol, choose red wine. At least it has the highest amount of phytonutrients. And only one drink a day for women and two for men. So in moderation. The rest, drink water, your best source of hydration. Okay. So your takeaway messages I hope you get from tonight be physically active, maintain a healthy body weight, not being over or underweight, eat mostly plant-based and minimally processed foods, eat a variety of fruits and vegetables and whole grains from all different colors, and eat foods, not supplements. We have our references over the next few slides, and now we'll take some questions. The question is, what's the best way to cook vegetables? Um, I'm going to answer it two ways. One, whichever way gets you to eat more. <laughs> In general, eat your vegetables. Eat more vegetables. We don't eat enough. And so even if it's not, the, even if it's not organic, even if it's not you know, cooked in the leanest way, eat them over not eat them. Now, if you have time to cook and to give thought into how you cook, you want, um, you want to avoid high heat temperature cooking. We know that causes um, your foods to make carcinogens. So avoid high heat, like deep frying. And you want to not cook them so long because that can destroy some nutrients that are heat sensitive. But in general, you're still going to get plenty of good nutrients, even if you roasted it for a long time. OK, so some like stir frying is a very popular way. You mentioned bok choy. That's a very popular way to cook it because you get it tender enough. It's easy to eat and it's tastier, um, but it's pretty quick. Does sugar feed cancer? The answer is yes. Does sugar feed all cells in your body just pretty much? Also, yes. Cancer cells do take up more sugar because they're rapidly dividing. Um, so the answer to that first one is yes. But then why? Um, the, the indirect relationship is really because it contributes to obesity. So it's all these extra calories. Absolutely. So those whole grains that you eat, the fruits, um, it will break down into sugar. So yes, sugar is a source, just as I mentioned. It, just like your cancer will use it as an energy source, so will your brain cells, so will your, your, your muscles need it. So yeah, that's why when we talk about um, a healthy diet, you're going to see lots of sources up there of carbohydrates, which breaks down to sugars, because we need about half of what we eat for energy purposes. The question is, if you have cancer and you eat sugar, does less sugar or no sugar, will it slow down the growth rate of cancer? Um, not directly. <laughs> I wouldn't say directly. There's not going to be, unfortunately, one food that you can eliminate and then your cancer is gone. But you can certainly do these things as part of your lifestyle to reduce the inflammatory state and to provide your body enough of the nutrients you actually need um, in the right balance to support a good, strong immune system, to support your ability to recover from a treatment and faster. 
I'm hogging all the answers. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I did want to just um, contribute a little bit to that um, that question there. Um, this this I question of does sugar feed cancer comes up a lot. One thing. Another thing, in addition to what H Helen offered, um, that we want people to understand about sugar as a component of your diet, is that what we really would like people to do, not just people who have cancer, but the general population, is to focus on reduced amounts of added sugar in the diet. Basically, what we want to do is we want to limit the amounts of and the frequency of large amounts of refined grains in the diet. We were talking a lot about whole grains and minimally processed grains. Now, there is a connection um, in terms of this thought of having lots of sugar, constantly large amounts, a lot of frequency. There's this concept, this idea that we think that large amounts and frequent amounts of concentrated sugar actually raises our insulin levels more often in, in, in our body. The idea also is that there's a connection between long, longer sustained and higher levels of insulin in the production of what's called insulin-like growth factor. And we think that higher levels of this insulin-like growth factor actually helps if cancer cells are present in the body, it helps push their growth. And so there's sort of like a cumulative effect there. So really what we're looking at is we're looking at a change in your dietary pattern, not so much that just a little bit of sugar is going to feed your cancer and that's the end of it. So it's a, there's a lot of different levels that we can look, look at on, on that spectrum. Yeah, that's a great question. So if you wanted to enjoy something that has some sugar, some added sugar, can you counterbalance it in some way? And that's 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 a great question because and the answer is yes. And this is actually what we talk a lot when we're talking uh, doing nutrition education for diabetics. What you want to do in, is in order to um, slow the the rate of absorption into the bloodstream is you want to eat sugar within the context of a mixed meal with other types of nutrients like with with um, fiber or with fat or with protein you don't want to have the sugar load just by itself because um, in terms of uh, absorption and how quickly foods go through the digestive system that's all influenced by the total uh, meal load so that's a good thank you so the question was, we've talked a lot about what is recommended for healthy foods, but what is the recommendation for added sugar or sugar in the diet? So when we talk about this concept of added sugar, we're talking about forms of sugar in the diet that aren't, I, I guess, if you will, a naturally part of the food we're eating. So for example, if we eat a, a piece of fruit, we're going to get a lot of you know, sugar, but that's an and uh, what's it, it's it's a natural part of the composition of that food. Whereas on the other hand, if we're eating some oatmeal and we add some table sugar to it, that is considered added sugar or the sugar that would be in um, a, a soda or something. So the answer is the guidelines are for women no more than six teaspoons, which is equivalent to about 24 grams of added sugar. Um, and for men, it's n it's 10, which would be about 40 grams of added sugar. So if you look at a can of soda, there's, uh, I don't know, maybe 60 grams in one can of soda. So you got to be careful. And it doesn't mean that you can't have soda. Just have a small amount and have it with a turkey sandwich, whole grain bread. There you go. <laughs> Very good question. The question is um, comparing chemotherapy to radiation. If if chemotherapy was five on a spectrum of one to ten with the impact on your immune system, where does radiation lie? And it really depends on where you're radiated. Because radiation can be targeted to just a very specific part of your body, it's it's and as opposed to chemotherapy, which is systemic. Um, it may not have as big of an impact on your immune system at all. So radiation, depending on where it is, is more likely to be way lower than chemotherapy. What about immunotherapy? 
Again, it depends on the target. Um, that would also rate lower. What about immunotherapy? Immunotherapy would rate lower than chemotherapy as well um, because it's a targeted mm -hmm, versus, again, chemotherapy affects your entire body. It will target a, a specific, specific part of your immune system. And if you remember earlier, there's... Right, so there's quite a few different variations, not variations, but parts of your immune system. So it depends on if it's T cells, B cells, monoclonal bodies. So it's, it really does, can depend. It can have more, but in general, if we're comparing just chemotherapy, which is systemic, I'm gonna say immunotherapy is lower. The question is how does stress relate to all this in terms of inflammation? and adrenaline and your response with that. So certainly then um, in any stressful situation, you're mentioning your adrenaline, your cortisol levels go up. That can, depends if it's a single event and then you recover from that, or is that like all the time? You're chronically stressed and you're not managing that. So that does play a role in inflammation. Yes. Okay, so the question was, um, you've asked your doctor, what can I eat? What should I do now that I'm done with treatment so I don't get cancer again? And then you come to our talk and we gave you all these yeah. great <laughs> recommendations. Well, I, I think that means we did our job as dietitians because we do specialize in this very um, part of your health care um, and that we can speak to these details. Um, and we did do a lot of general recommendations up here Things you already likely know, but how often do you do it? Do you do it every day? Do you do all eight of those things that were listed? So those are things you can compare yourself with and make one step towards either more often or one step you haven't started. Um, and if you want very specific, individualized counseling, um, we have dietitians in the Palo Alto area as well as the South Bay Cancer Center if you're interested to have a referral on, with a one-on-one -on -one counseling. And then I also want to mention that we also have, we just started our nutrition classes um, for new cancer patients. These are for patients who are just diagnosed, haven't started treatment or just started treatment, maybe one or two weeks in, don't have any symptoms yet, you're not struggling to eat, you just want to learn about nutrition. I'm going to say you got quite a bit of this lecture here, um, just, to, just in case you're interested to sign up for it. Um, but these are given on Thursdays. Um, you have a flyer with specific which ones, both at this location as well as South Bay. I do want to end the lecture with a couple of uh, announcements I want to let you guys know of. Um, I know quite a few of you guys actually ask about the sugar and cancer, the relationship of the both. This actually was a lecture topic that we gave last year. So if you, go, if you actually look at your pamphlets, this is our calendar for the Cancer Supportive Care Program. If you actually go to the first page, um, you will see on the right lower bottom hand corner is actually our website. If you go on our website, you're able to see that lecture recorded um, actually on the website. So feel free to look at that lecture and you will probably be able to learn a lot more specifically to this topic. Um, and also this lecture will be recorded, uh, actually it is recorded, <laughs> being recorded right now. Um, it will be posted on this website as, uh, as well in about two to three weeks time frame. So feel free to also look, uh, refer back to the uh, website if you want to just review any specific parts. That is correct. Yes, that is correct. So if you like, uh, please write your email and I can actually email the slides to you at the end, okay? Um, and I will also want to let you know, as Helen and Astrid, you know, are really trying to emphasize the importance of different, the importance of choosing the right foods for your diet. And exercise is a huge part of it. As part of the Cancer Supportive Care Program, in your, pen, uh, in your calendar, page six to eight is actually all our exercise classes available for cancer patients and also your caregivers that you can attend together. The specific one is actually the one-to-one -one exercise consultation where you get to meet with an exercise consultation one-on-one -on -one for one hour and she will be able to assess your current condition and kind of tailor make a plan for you. It's a very popular class, but it's also a class that we always recommend to patients no matter what state what stage of your treatment or your journey, or the cancer journey you're on. Please take advantage of it. Call the number on um, listed on the uh, booklet. And if whether you're in Palo Alto or South Bay, we can definitely fit you guys in because we are really here to make sure that you guys are doing the right thing, as you know that um, uh, that Madam has um, mentioned. And lastly, um, on May 
20th is actually our Stanford's Health Matter event. It's actually a free community event that um, School of Medicine is putting together for everyone in the, po uh, in the general public. So you don't need to be a Stanford patient um, to benefit from this particular event is get, we, we're going to be asking a lot of different um, physicians and also healthcare experts to talk on topics like sleep, immunotherapy, diet, um, and weight control, drug addiction, and t tons of different topics. I have left some of these pamphlets right outside uh, on the way out at the door. So feel free to take one and please come. And register, uh, registration info is actually inside of this booklet. Thank you so much, guys, for coming.